the hell is going on? What's really going on? We said, what the hell happened? You don't have to know what the hell is on it. They, they see what's going on. I don't know what's going on. What is going on? We must find out what is going on. Hi, I'm Danielle Pletka. And I'm Mark Thiessen. Welcome to our podcast, What the Hell is Going oh. On? What are we talking about today? We're talking about Ukraine. Not really. Yeah, no, we're talking about more the politics of Ukraine in Washington. It's yeah. like, we, you know, we, we've got a foreign policy podcast, obviously, and we wish that uh, foreign policy were front and center in every presidential campaign, but not this way. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really, you know, there's so much to talk about on Ukraine. I mean, obviously, Ukraine is still suffering under under Russian threat. The Crimea, which Russia has annexed, is still in Russian hands and hasn't been restored. And yet, you know, that's not what anybody cares about Ukraine for. That's not the reason why Ukraine is on anybody's lips. That's not the reason anybody knows the name of the president of Ukraine. Or the general prosecutors. Yeah, Multiple no of them. No are, kidding. Their household names in America today. So... Due to popular demand, we're going to talk about that instead. <laughs> <laughs> well, before, let me lay, raise an issue that is a substantive foreign policy issue as we enter into this. So everybody and the Democrats are up at arms at the possibility that Donald Trump may have withheld uh, security assistance to Ukraine in order to get Ukraine to investigate Hunter Biden. Putting aside the veracity of that for a second, let's keep in mind that this was the aid that the Obama administration repeatedly refused to give to the Ukrainian government after the invasion of Crimea. When, when the Russians invaded Crimea and started sending little green men, as they call them, into eastern Ukraine, the, the Ukrainians came to the Obama administration and said, we need uh, RPGs, rocket-propelled grenades. And the Obama administration said, no, but we'll give you MREs, meals ready to eat. And it was the Trump administration who correctly came in at the start of the administration and gave them that aid. So if there was any evidence that the Trump administration was using this aid as leverage, I would be very worried about that and unhappy about that. But let's keep in mind that the, all these people come saying, oh, my gosh, how can you hold up security assistance to Ukraine? Your party and your president refused to give them that assistance. No, that's right. Look, I got into this on Twitter last week with, with the Obama administration Politburo defending his his honor, who wasn't actually aware that they hadn't been sending any lethal, <laughs> to any lethal assistance. But look, Mark, that doesn't excuse Donald Trump. And I would say I don't think there's any doubt that, that he was trying to leverage, maybe not in that conversation, but the texts that we've seen between various people have made that clear. Now, Oh, I don't know. I, we, I, we all right. Well, we can that. argue about that in a second. But, yes. you know, we leverage assistance all the time. Sure. We leverage assistance, you know, to encourage economic reform, to encourage better pursuit of corruption, or, or because countries are not doing what we, what we want, that they're hanging out with the wrong people, supporting the wrong people, not extraditing the right people. There are a whole bunch of reasons. Not anybody in this town has the standing to get up on their high horse and say that we do not leverage our military or development or economic assistance because we do it all the time. The question is, and by the way, this isn't an impeachable question. The question is, was the president doing it to leverage more information about uh, about a political opponent? And so also— And you don't think he was? Well, here are two things. One, there are two investigations underway, which is there's the Barr-Durham investigation, which is an official Justice Department investigation into the origins of the Mueller probe, because after we spent— two years and tens of millions of dollars investigating whether Donald Trump colluded with the Russians and Mueller found out, no, there was no evidence that the president had committed any crimes and was colluding with Russia. People want to know, how did this whole thing get started? How did our country get paralyzed for two years with this horrible situation? And there, and there's majority support for that kind of an investigation. Uh, Bill Barr, the attorney general, hired John Durham, who is a career prosecutor and a good guy, and he's investigating that. And if the president wants to condition U.S. aid on Ukraine cooperating with that investigation, no That's problem fine. at all. That's fine. There, we but agree. It's a different thing, and we both agree, one, that he should never have – let's start with where we agree. He should never have mentioned Hunter Biden in that phone call. He should not be uh, using his office to uh, pressure them. Rudy. Or, or the Chinese. <laughs> or the, well, this whole thing about the Chinese was so crazy because he it, said it. But also, I mean, it just makes no sense because the allegation is for those who aren't following it is that Hunter Biden traveled with Vice President Biden on a plane to Beijing on Air Force Two, and a few weeks later was given a billion dollars by the Chinese government. So Donald Trump saying China should investigate that. Were they going to investigate themselves? 
They're, they're the ones who gave him the money. It doesn't, so, you know what? I, I don't care if it was France. It was, <laughs> I, I don't. I don't. It is unseemly. It is inappropriate. It is unethical for the president of the United States, I don't care what political party he or she comes from, to use that office in that way. I know you don't disagree. I don't disagree. Right. No. Whether and, it's and impeachable or not is an entirely different that's issue. That's a legal question. And we get into that in our question. Co- yeah, well, you're right. We get into that in a, in a bit. Um, but. This is you know, this is it's, this is just it's awful. Look, it, it, it is awful. And and the one thing I'm happy to blame the Democrats for, you know, looking for a serial set of anything that they could pin to Donald Trump. But when you talk about throwing stuff against the wall, you know, they're doing it. But he's helping them every. Oh step no of doubt, the way. he's his own worst enemy. I mean, look, we just got out of the Mueller probe. He got a get out of jail free card because he didn't do it, uh, you know. Yeah. And, and just shut up. And just shut up. Exactly. Sit why back. Would you, why would go you go to Disney World? Well, actually, pivot and like run the country and be successful. Yeah. And and focus on policy. And you're freed of this now. And instead, he creates another morass. So he's he's his own worst enemy, and he's given them a pretext. But the Democrats, this is is this is political. You look at the uh, Washington Post story on the day of the inauguration, Trump impeachment inquiry begins. You know, that they're, they were starting to impeach him the, on the day he took office, and this is the latest pretext on which to do it. I don't disagree with you. And, and I think if all of these other things hadn't happened, if they hadn't tried to run everything from Stormy Daniels to Avenatti to Cohen up the flagpole, yeah. then this would have a lot more credibility. It's like the boy who cried wolf. Yeah. You know, that they, they, you've tried everything. And it's, look, it's the same people... Adam Schiff, the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, during the impeachment inquiry, I wrote a column about this in the Washington Post about the hall of shame of these Democrats, people who had security clearances, who were in the intelligence committees or former intelligence officials, who made it sound like they had inside information the rest of us couldn't see that there was evidence that Donald Trump had done something wrong with Russia. And it ended up not being true. And they right. said, there's clearly evidence of collusion. Right. There wasn't. And so now they're going out and asking the American people to trust them that they're not doing the same thing today. But this is the, the whole thing. Look, Schiff, Nadler, the rest of them, Donald Trump, Rudy Giuliani, and all the rest – they are they are our national shame. This is the problem. This is a disservice to our democracy. This is hurting us. This is hurting our political system. It's hurting the credibility and integrity of our system. It's chipping away at the Constitution by redefining the intention of the Constitution and impeachment. These are bad things. And it is amazing to me that we do not have a political figure out there on the Democratic side and on the Republican side, who we can turn to, who says, stop, stop this. Yeah. Who is that person? There is none right now. Right. Um, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's become very tribal. And the other thing that uh, that is bothering me is how so many people in the media are bending over backwards to say, it, to in order to go to after Donald Hunter Trump, Biden? to excuse, excuse Joe Biden of any of uh, doing anything wrong whatsoever. You know, oh, the Ukrainian, the, you know, the Ukrainian prosecutor, we've got a, he said, she said, the prosecutor who he got fired by threatening a billion dollars in security assistance. Right. He says that he was investigating Hunter Biden. We don't know if that's true. And everybody says, well, his successor says it wasn't true. That guy's just as corrupt as the, as the first one. We don't know who to believe over there. And but people are so willing to over, to overlook, to see, they feel like they have to clear Joe Biden of any wrongdoing in, it in order to go after Donald Trump. Two things can be true at the same time, which right. is that Donald Trump did something wrong and Joe Biden did something wrong. Right, and wrong. neither mitigates the other. And but that none of this is about right and wrong. All of this is about politics. So, look, everybody is so focused on the impact that this is going to have on Donald Trump and the impeachment. But this is going to have an impact on Joe Biden. Joe Biden cannot ignore or avoid this. And there's actually a clip we want to play of uh, Joe Biden getting asked about this in a uh, press conference the other day. How is your role as vice president in, uh, in charge of policy in Ukraine and your son's job in Ukraine? How is that not a conflict of interest? It's not a conflict of interest. There's been no indication of any conflict of interest from Ukraine or anywhere else. Period. I'm not going to. I'm not going to respond to that. Let's focus on the problem. Focus on this man, what he's doing, that no president has ever done. No president. So he basically said, "I'm not going to answer that." He he was asked, "Was there any conflict of interest?" You can't not ask to answer that. There was a conflict of interest. It says plain as day in the Code of Federal Regulations that if a federal official takes action, he knows will affect, quote, a relative with whom the employee has a close personal relationship, unquote, 
quote, and the circumstances would cause a reasonable person with knowledge of the relevant fact to question his impartiality in the matter, the employee should not participate in the matter. It's very clear that Joe Biden is in violation of those regulations, that as a federal employee, he shouldn't be doing it. And yet everybody is bending over backwards trying to say, nothing to see here, nothing to see here. Right. Focus on Donald Trump. Don't there focus is some, on Joe Biden. There is something to see here. There's something to see here. There's something to see with the Trump family. This is this dynastic nightmare that we've entered into in America where the Chelsea's and the Don Juniors and the Ivanka's and the Hunters all become part of our political quilt. And it's gross and it's unseemly and it shouldn't be the case. But that's just more politics for us. And that's really what we're talking about here today. And we've got the perfect person to talk to us about the politics of this whole situation. Joining us on the podcast today is Carl Rove. He really needs no introduction. This is the man known as the architect. He was the senior advisor and a deputy chief of staff during the George W. Bush administration. He's had a really illustrious career, but he's just one of the finest political analysts uh, that I know. And on top of that, is just an awesome, lovely guy. Absolutely. So here we are talking to Carl Rove. All right, Carl Rove, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Yes, we're here in the, the mothership, AEI. <laughs> It's 1789 Massachusetts Avenue Northwest. Don't tell people our address. They can come get us. No, they can send you checks. <laughs> no. they, can, they can send you bags of cookies. They can stop by and shake your hand. Come on. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's what they're going to do, Mark. That's what they're going to do. Exactly. <laughs> well, good. Well, so we when we originally asked you to come on several weeks ago, we wanted to talk about foreign policy and presidential campaigns. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we, were, we were bemoaning the fact that no one was discussing foreign policy at all. And a few weeks later, things are very different. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, tell I mean, give us your thoughts. We're here. Uh, we've got the impeachment going on. Right, uh, Adam right. Schiff is moving forward. Right. Pelosi has having her official, I just did air quotes, uh, impeachment inquiry. Where do we stand? Uh, it's a mess in the mortal words of a character in a movie. You know, look, um, I wish the president had not brought it up in any conversation. I particularly wish the president had not allowed Mayor Rudy Giuliani to act as his private emissary wandering around Central Europe making phone calls and having visits. Agreed. But having said that, this is this, nobody's going to walk out of this thing looking good. The president, uh, has, this is the excuse that Nancy Pelosi needed in order to launch on her own authority, mm -hmm. which is unusual, uh, a formal impeachment inquiry mm -hmm. uh, to grab it away from Gerald Nadler, the you know inept chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, and hand it over to the equally inept uh, Adam Schiff to head it up, uh, to share the responsibility among six different committee chairs to investigate the president as part of this, quote, formal impeachment inquiry, and to basically run roughshod over the procedures and rules. Think about this. In 1997, when there is enormous antagonism between the House Republicans and President Bill Clinton and the impeachment investigation begins, one of the first actions is to grant the minority, led by John Conyers of New York, witness and subpoena authority. And that ain't happening this time around. There's no pretense that this is going to be a balanced investigation where the majority and the minority, the president's detractors and the president's defenders are going to be on equal ground. Uh, only one group gets to call witnesses and subpoena documents and to set the, the, the procedures, and that is the Democratic majority. So why does she not want to have a vote? Is it because she doesn't want to endanger those uh, those freshman Democrats oh, yeah. who, who won in Trump district? Oh, yeah. Look, there are 43 Democrat members of Congress who flipped Republican seats, 31 of them in districts that, that Trump carried, 19 of them in districts that he carried by four points or more. It's not an accident that of the 19 Democrat members in those seats, 10 of them have yet to come out and support an impeachment inquiry. Mm -hmm. So yeah, she knows that her majority in the House depended upon flipping Republican seats, and she doesn't want to put those people in, in danger by having a vote. So unlike with Andrew Johnson, and unlike with Richard Nixon, and unlike with Bill Clinton, we now have an official uh, impeachment proceeding without the House of Representatives voting to authorize it. So Let's just talk a little bit about about what happened. And I don't want to ask you about Ukraine. None of us are, are Ukraine experts, even though Mark and I focus a lot on, on national security. I'm more concerned about this question of what constitutes an illegal foreign campaign contribution, because this has become an extraordinarily important crutch for right. almost all of the Democratic right. claims against right. the Stormy Daniels payoff, right. right? all of the Avenatti stuff. And you, you lived and breathed this for, for so long. 
What constitutes an illegal foreign campaign contribution in your view? Well, n- none of what we're talking about. Because if it did, if, if saying to the Ukrainians, once you look into the Joe Biden thing, is an illegal campaign contribution, then what is having Christopher Steele call a bunch of GRU, KGB, and FSB former agents in Moscow and saying, you got any dirt on Donald Trump? That's, that, that was an expenditure of campaign funds to hire Christopher Steele to make those calls. What is you want a campaign contribution? How about the president of the United States saying to the, to the phony leader of Russia, tell Vladimir that I'll have more flexibility after the election if he doesn't press me during the 2012 contest about uh, our, our missile defense programs. I mean, you know, this is, we're getting into murky swamps. We're looking for excuses. The idea that information is a value. What about the Democrats who sent somebody over to Ukraine to say, do you have any bad stuff on Trump during the 2016 election? So, no, we don't want to go this way. We really don't, as a country, want to tear ourselves up and get involved in a constitutional crisis because somebody says, oh, Trump was looking for an illegal campaign contribution by saying to the Ukrainians, look into this Joe Biden thing, because everybody's hands would then be dirty. Right. Now, we, we, I think we all should underscore that Nobody thinks the notion of the president of the United States calling up uh, a foreign leader and talking about this kind of thing is appropriate, is a, a good use of power, is the most ethical use of, yeah. of, the, of the most important office yeah. in the land. Yeah. We're really just talking about categories here of how these are being lawyered, yeah. if you want. Part of the problem is, and everything that everybody does only feeds into this personal narrative, I think the president thinks not without some reason, that every one of these things is an assault on the legitimacy of his presidency. Oh, sure it is. That's why they stone the wall. That's why. (laughs) Bingo. Yeah, he's right. exactly. But anyway, so the so the Mueller probe ends and Adam Schiff, who said that he had seen evidence that Donald Trump had colluded with Russia and that Swalwell said that he was working for the Russians, this was uncontrovertible, all of a sudden it's not true. And so Americans rightly ask, how the hell did this happen yeah. uh, for, for two years? And so the polls showed after uh, the Mueller probe that 61 percent wanted to appoint a special counsel to investigate the investigators and find right. out how we got here. And so that's what, what Barr has done with Durham. Right. He's, there is an investigation into how did this investigation start? Was there any malfeasance? And that's an official Justice Department investigation being run by John Durham, a career prosecutor who uh, he's the guy who investigated the CIA interrogation program under Obama, was appointed by Eric Holder and found that nothing nothing yeah. illegal was done. So, well, he's do. so and, look, and, and then look, there's the I, Durham. I, I know Durham. Durham was the career prosecutor in Connecticut when we came in in 2001, and we were looking for a U.S. attorney for Connecticut, and the issue was official misconduct at the local level, and everybody said, this is a straight arrow, straight shooter, career, apolitical guy, tough as nails, straight arrow, appoint him, and we appointed him, and you know what he did? He investigated the sitting Republican governor of Connecticut and sent him to jail because he found out he was taking money under the table, despite the fact that John Rowling was a close political friend and a a personal friend of the sitting president of the United States and one of the first governors to endorse his candidacy for presidency. And Durham was a tough nut who said, I don't care where the chips are going to fall. My job is to deal with official miscorruption. How lucky are we to have our second Boy Scout, Eagle Scout, straight arrow in a row, Bob Mueller first, and now John Durham tasked with these important jobs? You've got this Durham probe, which Barr has been helping introducing. And Barr should should be the guy. It is entirely appropriate for him to say exactly. to his op- opposite numbers, you're the state prosecutor in Ukraine. I-, I hope you'll cooperate with my man Durham, who's looking into the origins and what what role Ukraine may or may not have played in that drama. And then you've got the Giuliani probe uh, investigation, which if you say, if the Democrats said that the uh, the Steele dossier was okay, just opposition research, nothing wrong with Giuliani, the president hiring a private lawyer to go investigate Hunter Biden. Except for the, the fact that, except, of course. But that's, right. here's the thing. <laughs> what the, Where he gets into trouble is that he blurred the lines between official and unofficial. Absolutely. Giul- Giuliani's out there saying, I'm working on behalf of the State Department, talking about it with the president of Ukraine. Giuliani apparently putting White House seals on documents that he printed off of his yeah. printer at Fake home. Fake White House Fake seals. White House seals. Yeah. I mean, is that where we've gone wrong? Yeah, yeah. And this no, is where yeah. the president and has look, Rudy ought to be out of this. And and look, let's also say I, there's a little bit of of, of self gratification, self congratulations in Rudy, who says I uncovered these things. No, he didn't. These things were uncovered by James Risen in a December 2015 piece in the New York Times that said Hunter Biden is on the board of Burisma, and here are all these people with NGOs in Ukraine involved in anti corruption efforts who are scratching their heads saying, doesn't the Vice President of the United States get it that he looks a little weird for him to be over here? Lecturing 
lecturing Ukraine on anti-corruption efforts when his boy is a member of a stinky situation. And this is repeated by articles in the Wall Street Journal at the same time. This is five months before Biden goes over and has that famous, you know, you got to fire the prosecutor in the next six hours before I get on Air Force Two or you're losing a billion dollars in loan guarantees. I mean, talk about a quid pro quo. And yet it was done at a moment where where nobody, it seems, in the Obama administration, they had to be aware of this. They had to be. Look, it was a matter of public record. You cannot tell me that the political officers in the, the embassy in Ukraine in March of 2015, I guess it is, did not know that Hunter Biden has been named a member. So, I mean, obviously we know what the problem was. I think there were people in the Obama administration very worried about Hunter yeah. Biden for a whole variety of reasons right. that just included Burisma, but right. it was part of a long list. Well, in The New Yorker, Amos Hochstein, who was the Obama energy czar, it says that he went to Biden in 2015 before his trip to Ukraine and told talked to him about Hunter Biden and this whole Burisma thing. So that we even have, and Hunter Biden said that he talked to his father about it. So yeah. we have, well, there, it was, he was aware. Hey, we haven't mentioned one other name in this drama who should have spoken up. The Secretary of State, John Kerry. Remember, the guy who in 2009 goes to John Kerry's stepson, Christopher Hines, and to Hunter Biden and says, let's get together in a firm called Rosemont Seneca is Devin Archer, longtime political handyman for John Kerry. So he's the first guy who goes on the Burisma board, and that should have set off alarm bells at, at the State Department, and John Kerry should have picked up the phone and called Devin Archer and said, what in the hell are you doing? This is so egregious that after Hunter Biden joins the board, Christopher Hines, Kerry's stepson, at least has the good judgment to say, I'm out of this deal. This stinks. This is, this is preying on my, on my stepfather's good name. This this whole thing is, as you rightly say, this is not going to end with anybody yeah, looking no, good. No. And, 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 you know, while a lot of us have been accused of whataboutism uh, because of the Hunter Biden case, the reality is that the president shouldn't have done this, that the vice former vice president's son and current presidential contender Joe Biden's son shouldn't have done this. This shouldn't be a thing. Right. Uh, it, you know, it besmirches our yeah. democracy. But it does not rise, in my opinion, to the level of high crimes and misdemeanors worthy of removing the president of the United States. But, of course, that's not, you know, at the end of the day, you know this, Carl. Yeah. That's not what this is about. Right. This isn't about the law. This is about right. politics. And that's one of the reasons why I think the American public hasn't hasn't yeah. signed on to the yeah. bandwagon. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. recognize that this is about politics, not about law breaking. But it, that makes it even more sad in many respects. These people are willing to plunge us into this kind of a crisis just because they want to score some political points, you know, 11 months in advance of the presidential election. And Donald Trump hasn't hesitated to help, yeah, frankly. Yeah, he yeah. hasn't. You know, he's he gives them the ammo. Yeah. The question is, in the weeks ahead, is the president going to step back? Is there going to be less resentment and anger? And I understand why he's angry, because he thinks this is, as you said, aimed at the legitimacy of his presidency, Mark. But is he going to step back and sort of say, OK, they're going to do what they're going to do, and I'm going to be stay focused on, I'm going to have somebody else out there responding to him, and I'm going to be focused on the bigger things that the American people want me to be concerned about? I'm not going to hold my breath for that. But I want to <laughs> ask you a question, because it is, because as we all agree, you know, this is really... The, the right approach to this is sorrow, not anger. Right, exactly. It is bad for our system. It is bad for our political system. And the people who are laughing all the way to their, you know, dachas and right. their uh, dictator palaces right. are the Chinese and the Russians, right. the North Koreans and the Iranians. Right. Because this is good for yeah. bad guys. How does this fit in? You know, you who've been looking at politics, political parties and political process for so long. One of the things we see is that around the world, Traditional political parties are in tons of trouble. Right. It's not just here where we're having the Donald Trumps redefine the Republican Party right. and the AOCs and the squads redefine right. the Democratic Party, right. not to speak of Elizabeth Warren and Bernie right. Sanders. Yeah. But the same is true in the UK, in right. France, in Australia, right. all around in Hungary. What's going on? Well, we're in a populist moment. Uh, a lot of it, I think, has to do with the financial collapse, but there are other subordinate issues that are regional in nature. I think that in Europe, part of it is the sense of the loss of national identity. We, the Italians, we, the Brits, are being now run by a bunch of bureaucrats, faceless bureaucrats in Brussels, and we're no longer in charge of our destiny. In some countries, like the Scandinavian countries, it is we are welcoming open society, and now a quarter of the kids in Stockholm schools are uh, Muslims from the Middle East, and they're not assimilating into our society. But I think a lot of it has 
has to do with sort of the aftermath, and particularly in the United States, the aftermath of the financial crisis. Populism is not an, a co coherent ideology. In some ways, it's a sentiment. So you can have people on the right and left both be populist. Both say, we've got to disrupt the existing structure because the little man is not getting his due. On the right, it is, you bailed out the banks and you did so with my money, and I didn't get bailed out. I paid my bills. I paid my mortgage. I paid my credit card. But you took care of people who were undeserving of this. And after you did that, you then started taking more money from me in the stimulus bill and handing it out willy-nilly to everybody, including Solyndra. And the relationship between the little man and his government has been distorted, and the little man needs to get his day. And on the left, it was the same thing. You bailed out the banks, nobody went to jail, and you didn't help me. Why are you helping those big boys? I deserve part of that pie, and I feel, I'm full of resentment and anger that people who seem to be getting by while I'm struggling, and that's because the relationship between the government and the little man has been broken. It's dominated by people who have a loophole in the law or a lobbyist in Washington, and by God, it's time for me to get my fair share. And this is disrupting both political parties. But let's not kid ourselves. It, it disrupted us in 2016, but it also disrupted the Democrats. Remember, Bernie Sanders' first Democratic convention he ever ever attended in his life was the one where he was fighting for the nomination of the Democratic Party. He'd run for, he'd, he'd never run, he'd run for State House of Representatives, Mayor of Burlington, U.S. Congress, Governor and Senator. And in every one of those elections, he either was beaten by or beat a Democrat and a Republican because he ran as an independent, self-described Democratic Socialist in every one of those races. And he gives her a race for her money. I mean, he raises $230 million without holding a single fundraising event. He sends out, you know, emails and tweets and people, you know, left-wingers with credit cards go online and, and send him $230 million. That, to me, was one of the most astonishing moments in American politics, proving also there's a problem with our credit system that so many companies <laughs> can get Visa and MasterCards in order to go online and contribute. <laughs> so, quick, quick question about a word you used. You called it a populist moment. Right. Is, is it a moment or, or is this a, a real tipping change, point. a tipping point? No, I think, look, populism is unsustainable over the long haul as long as responsible parties, political parties uh, react to it. Uh, you know, it's, we've seen to this to a little bit in Austria where a conservative party has found its, its way to handle this. We're seeing this, I think, in Germany where of the CDU, CSU is responding to the AFK by finding a better way. We're seeing this in somewhat in the Scandinavian countries where they're trying to find a response to the People's Party and the Democrats. But, but it, it, it won't be solved overnight, and it's going to require us to rethink a lot of what undergirds center-right thinking. And it's also going to require some statesmen to, to emerge. And that, that's the key ingredient that's going to take some There time. isn't there a fundamental shift happening, which is you, you've seen the – Work, working class voters have abandoned the Democratic Party and joined the Republican Party mm -hmm. under Trump. And then in, in 2016 and then in 2018, you saw a lot of suburban voters who had been in Republican districts going over to the Democratic Party. Isn't this a lasting shift that could be taking place where the Republican Party is becoming the party of the working class and the Democrats are becoming the party of the middle class and upper class cosmopolitan elites, yeah. um, uh, coastal elites? Yeah, that's. I think there is some truth to that. But on the other hand, there are a big bunch of people who are college educated who don't live on the coast. They, they live, you know, they live in the great hard land of America mm -hmm. who voted, some of them reluctantly for Trump. They like sort of his policies. They don't like how he handles himself. They had one chance in 2018 to send a protest vote. The question is, where are they going to be long term? And this is going to depend, again, upon the adroitness of the two parties. The Democratic Party, if it was a party of traditional Democrats who sort of moved slightly to the left, might be able to hold on to those people. But if the Republican Party gets its act together, they, those people are fundamentally sort of center, center right, and they can be grabbed by look, they can be grabbed by Republicans. Take take for example in in Texas, tr Trump wins by nine points, closest since Bob Dole in 1996. But on the other hand, in our governor's race, our governor wins by nearly 15 points. So it says something about the ability of a traditional Republican to get the the support of those college of some of those college educated suburbanites back. So what happens? I mean, you know, Mark and I focus on, you know, national security most of the time. And one of the things that really worried us was that both of our candidates in the 2016 election were 
interested in retreat, in retrenchment, yeah. Yeah. Um, in moving away from traditional trade, uh, in moving away from traditional alliances. And, you know, that that can't be a slam just on Donald Trump because Hillary Clinton and even more Bernie Sanders uh, wanted uh, wanted out from, you know, even from NAFTA, not Hillary, but but Bernie. What what is the the dramatis personae as we see it now? Understanding that only we weirdos are actually thinking about the twenty twenty election. Normal yeah. people are not yet worried. What does <laughs> what does this mean for our future in terms of our engagement with the world? Yeah, um, I'm thinking a lot about this because we got a mutual friend, Will M. Bowden, who's asked me to come and give a talk in Dallas at the end of month uh, on behalf of the Clement Center, which is a grand strategy program at UT. So I'm I'm thinking about this. This is anecdotal. So don't put a lot of, you know, credibility in it. But as I go around the country, and I travel a lot and talk to people, I get the sense that a lot of this 2016 sort of America first had to do with the word America. It's sort of like after eight years of feeling like our country was not led by somebody who saw us for the great and good power in the world that we are and who sort of talked about leading from behind, that what they were concerned about is America. So they like the idea of, you know, we're, we're bearing the burden in NATO, but where are the rest of these guys and gals? Well, you, they need to step up. You know, we, with China, they've been kicking us around. It's been getting worse and worse. I mean, the China that we deal with today is a very different China that we dealt with in 2001. That's like, for sure. The China sure. we deal with today is different than the China of five years ago or 10 years ago. And so as conditions changed in the world, the question was, who's standing up for America? And given a choice, they had somebody associated with things as they were, the Secretary of State to Barack Obama, and a guy who said, I'm for America first. But the most important thing was there, America. And so as I go around the the country, let me give you two examples. I'm speaking in a conference on, of all things, health care. But it is small business people, insurance people, health care professionals, and hospital people. Big crowd. Middle America. And they had a Q&A session. A guy stands up and out of the blue starts talking about the Green New Deal. And so what do you think of it? And I said, you know, what really bothers me is, is that we're cri- we keep criticizing our country on the, on the issue of climate. And yet we are the only major industrialized country in the world for the last 20, nearly 20 years, has reduced the absolute level of greenhouse gas emissions while growing our economy. There have been some countries like, you know, temporarily Russia that reduced their greenhouse gas emissions, but that's because their economy was cratering. But we've been growing our economy and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. 28 countries in the Paris Climate Accords, 23 of them haven't even met 50 percent of their goals. Nobody's met their goals. And we're the only ones reducing the absolute level. If the rest of the world was doing what we were doing, we'd be all talking about how we're solving the climate problem. And I said, I'm sick and tired of people kicking around the United States when we're actually pursuing policies, consciously or unconsciously, that are achieving this great goal. People started applauding and cheering. Fascinating. And, I, and I'm like, wow. But I also, in ta- I was at Tufts University last week. Talk about a liberal school. Not the heartland. Not the heartland. <laughs> but I talked about, and we got to talking about the Iraq war, and I talked about the necessity of American leadership in the world, whether it's to confront AIDS in Africa or to stand up to international terrorism or to stand the lonely watch for 40 years in the fight against Soviet communism. And I had a lot of nodding heads of 19 and 20-year-olds in the room. The conservatives and people in the heartland are not not isolationists. They're reluctant internationalists. That's which correct. Is a very, which is a very different thing. They don't want to run around and topple regimes, uh, that, but they're willing to engage if they're led. And ex- if people explain the stakes of victory right. and the consequences of defeat. And but, this is this worries me most of all about our international relations. Think about this. For 40 or 50 years, we had sort of a rough consensus among most Republicans and most Democrats that we needed to stand up to Soviet communism. There's no way that you can say we have a rough consensus today. Maybe Republicans are instinctively ready to stand up against international Islamic terrorism, but we got a lot of people on the other side who have forsaken the view that America is a good power in the world. I think that's absolutely true. And and it it is a a bankruptcy of of leadership because I think that it's right. The the American people, they want to hear what you want to do. They don't want to race off you into, have to into foreign, you but you have, have to explain it, right? And you have to lead. So uh, let's circle back to Joe Biden for a second. So is the third quarter numbers came out uh, for him. Ismail, number four. We're yeah. number four. <laughs> Fundraising, we're number four. Okay. Um, I That's think, an early vote, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It, it is. It, it is. And, and I know that, I mean, I sus- okay, I know nothing about political strategy, but I suspect a lot of the president's focus on Hunter Biden has been because he views Joe Biden as a formidable opponent in 2020. Do you think that's right? 
I think, well, I don't know if he, if that's why he's focusing on it. I think it's just the most early available opportunity, hmm. uh, you know, target of opportunity. But I do think he, if, if he does think that he is the most dangerous to face in the general election, yes, because he's the most traditional Democrat. I mean, you can look at Elizabeth Warren and we can look at Bernie Sanders and say, those are lunatics. The conservative can look at him and say, that's way out there. No way we could be supportive of that. But you can look at Joe and say, the country would survive four years. In fact, my my deep concern would be if he got the nomination, stood up at the Democratic Party convention with a lot of left-wingers in the audience and said, I know this is going to be unpopular in this room, but I'm going to devote the next four years to healing our country and bring us together, to try and find common ground between Republicans and Democrats, make Washington work, restore the confidence of the American people in their government, and I'm going to serve one term, and after that term, we're going to turn the page, and there'll be a wonderful chapter in our great American experiment, but for the next four years, my object is to be the president of the entire country, not the president of this party or of this faction, and and the Sandernistas would boo him, but the American people would applaud him. So who's it? I can't ask you who's it going to be because that's silly on my part. But that is an early vote. That, yeah, those numbers, oh, those yeah. numbers oh, are yeah. an early vote. And Elizabeth yeah. Warren is kicking yeah. is kicking butt. Yeah. Is there you know when you when you ran in the Bush campaign in two thousand, one of the wins behind you was Clinton exhaustion. People are just yeah. sick and tired of the of the, of the yeah. chaos. Is there Trump exhaustion now? Yes, I'm exhausted. That, well, I mean, but is it? But to the point that people are, are willing to say we're going to take, an, even though the economy is doing great, yep. uh, we're willing to go in yep. a different direction. Well, yes, but each election is different in many respects and similar in other respects. The one thing is, is that in 2000, we made the conscious decision that the more we harped upon the situation of Clinton, the worse it would be for us, which is why we never went after Clinton's personal behavior, and all Bush said was proactively what he was for. I will restore dignity and honor to the White House. That was it. Mm -hmm. And so to the degree that Democrats are harping on Trump, we're in a tribal moment. You attack the leader of my tribe, and I'm going to rally to his side or her Mm -hmm. side. So the more that the Democrats try and make this about, oh, look at these bad things of Donald Trump, and we're going to stop these, as opposed to an affirmative vision of what they want to try and do, the the more that they're talking about him, the more that they will energize his supporters. We saw this in Kavanaugh. They go after Kavanaugh, and what's the result? People came out of the woodwork suddenly to support Republican candidates for the Senate and House and to send money and to stand up and be, be heard because of the revulsion of you know, you attacked our guy. I'm going to rally to his support. So let's let's do a quick going back to Ukraine and impeachment and all of what's happening here. Let's assume the Democrats are going to go pursue impeachment. Let's do a, a lightning round on the impact on different races. So, what's the impact on Joe Biden? Is this going to finish Joe Biden? I, I wrote in my column last week that I thought it would. Uh, could doom his candidacy because, look, we're going to hear uh, ordinary people, the swing voters, the 8 or 10 percent of the electorate or swing voters are going to hear about this and say, you know what, I maybe was for him in the matchup head-to-head with Trump, but now I'm not. So the margin between he and Trump is going to shrink, and so is the argument that he is the most electable. And he's in the way of uh, of pursuing the impeachment stuff. Uh, What's the impact on Trump 2020? I think it all depends on how it plays out, but I think it's going to be more positive than negative for Trump because I think the Democrats are making two big mistakes. They're moving too rapidly, and the rhetoric is not above politics. It is uh, just saturated with politics. People forget the Select Committee on Watergate investigated for 13 months and did so in a patient manner. The country lawyer, Sam Irvin, young Republican from Tennessee, Howard Baker. What did the president know and when did he know it? And then remember, we had that overlapped a month with a three-month-long investigation by the House Judiciary Committee in which Democrat Peter Rodino rose from obscurity to be a national figure of integrity and calm and purpose in which he gave every Republican on that committee a chance to defend Nixon. And, And at the end of the process, people said, particularly after the eight tape came out, the smoking gun tape came out, it's time for the president to go. They're going to try and get the, they want to try and get this thing done by Thanksgiving. They won't, but they may get it done by Christmas, and it's going to look like it was rushed and partisan and negative. I, we were talking about this earlier. 1997, the Republicans, one of the first things they did during the formal investigation was to give the authority to the minority led by John Conyers to call witnesses and issue subpoenas. Never, Not going to happen for the Republicans this time around. What is going to be the impact on control of the House? Can the Democrats lose the House over this? They could, but I doubt it. I think they'll lose seats. 
but Pelosi doesn't want to lose any seats because the seats she loses are going to be among the moderate and traditional Democrats. And that means that in her caucus, if she holds the House, the percentage of the, the squad and the left wingers is going to be even bigger. And she's finding it hard enough to run a restive caucus. Imagine what would happen if they fail to impeach. And after the election, she holds on to the House and win or lose. She's got the squad and, and that ilk being a bigger share of her caucus. And what's the impact on the Senate? We were hearing stories that the Democrats are getting giddy that they think that this is going to help them uh, win back the Senate by putting a lot of vulnerable Republicans in a tough position. Well, I don't think so, because I think at the end of the day, you know, we got six races that we got to worry about. We got to worry about Arizona, Colorado, Iowa, North Carolina, Maine, and and maybe uh, one of the Georgia seats. But I think in those states, it depends on how the Republican handles it. If they say, look, you know, I'm critical of the president making that request in that, but out of, you know, out of 1,958 words, he devotes 60 of them to saying, would you look into the Biden thing? But I don't think it rises to removing him from office less than a year before the election. I'm sighing because, uh, I'm sighing because, I, I wish we weren't talking about this. Oh, there's so nothing much good for our country. There's so nothing much going on. Nothing good for on. our country in this. Nothing. There's so much going on in the world. You know, Ukraine. Ukraine needs us. Yes. Yeah. Ukraine is being threatened by Russia. It shouldn't be a pawn. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Iranians are are on the march. We've got the Chinese. You know, uh, shooting people in in Hong Kong. There are so many other and things. waging economic warfare against the United States, particularly to gain control of these high grounds of critical technologies for the 21st century. And, and North Korea. The, so vulnerable to a concerted effort by the West to respond, we could fundamentally affect China in a positive direction for decades to come if we were focused on that rather than on all this other stuff. Amen. Carl, thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for joining us. Yep, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Okay, I don't think we ever sold that. He was awesome. <laughs> no, I mean that. I, you know, I'm I'm always I'm always so pleased to talk to Carl Wolf because, you know, we're national security people. He's a political guy, but he's thinking about he's thinking about all aspects of this. You know, while we're tearing our our hair out about this this impeachment nightmare, the real world is still going on, and uh, and I'm really worried about what our choices are going to look like in 2020. Oh, well, they're like they were in 2016. Uh, they were they were awful choices. But I mean, look, the the reality is, I think this impeachment push, he's he points out that this is the the rush to get this done so quickly undermines the legitimacy the legitimacy of the impeachment inquiry. And he goes back and points out to you know Peter Rodino and the and the people in the in, during the Watergate scandal and, and didn't mention I, Henry Hyde, who yeah. really was you know a it was, very serious. But it was run in a very bipartisan way, and it was done in a way, like he said, gives the, the minority the chance to subpoena witnesses and to present its case. And this is being done in such a partisan way that it gives the president the opening, which he is seizing, to point out that this is simply a effort to nullify the presidential election, which I think he's got a good point. He may have done. We agree that he should have made that uh, said what he said in the phone call. Uh, we have some disagreement over whether uh, he was really using security assistance to get that done. Um, but, you know, regardless, he's, he gave them the pretext, but he's going to be able to make the case that this is a political political effort to remove him from office, and he's right. And on that point, ladies and gentlemen, we agree. We'll see you guys you, next week. What, are you in a hurry to get out of here? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't say that. My parking's about to expire. Our team here at AEI is Alexa Santry, Matt Winesett, Jen Moretta, and Macy Heath. Let us know what topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing us at whatthehell at AEI.org. Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at D. Pletka. And I'm at Mark Thiessen. That's Mark with a C. Please rate and review the podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe, share it, comment on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to this. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.